I'm going to ask everyone to open this morning to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 14 through chapter 15 verse 3, we learn the four guidelines for determining personal choices and convictions. And guys, I hope that all of us, as we go through these passages, this may be the only time in your life that someone ever goes verse by verse through this portion of the Bible because by God's grace, we're going to move on to other scriptures. It may never be here again. But you should always learn what God wanted you to learn when you were in this portion. Does anybody remember? Do we remember together? What are the four guidelines that are to help a Christian determine his personal choices and his convictions. There are four things, Romans 14 through chapter 15, verse 3 taught us. The first one comes from Romans 14, 1 to 9. The Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Christ. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I should not, if I understand the freedom that I have in Jesus, that I am no longer bound to the law, and yet I meet Christian people who've been saved by God's grace just like me. But they have a real tender conscience about some of these things. They feel like, you know, I still should still obey the Old Testament dietary laws. I should still do the old Jewish feast days. And to not do that would be sinful. I should, even though I understand that that's not true, I should not despise the person who feels that way. Instead, I ought to, to love him and be concerned that I not hurt him. The guy who has the strong convictions about this may look at the guy who understands the gospel better and judge him because he says, wow, that guy doesn't really have the right uh, standards like I do, and I think that guy's a, not a very good Christian. And the Bible says that's wrong of that guy to judge him. So the strong should not despise the weak, and the weak should not judge the strong. Instead, all of us should realize that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. Christ died to make himself the Lord, both of the dead and the living. So as a Christian, the thing that, one of the things that guides how I live is the fact that Jesus is my Lord. And because everything I do is to demonstrate his value, that is what helps me decide what I'm going to do. If I can't do this behavior to God's honor, if it doesn't reflect well on my Savior, then I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't talk that way. I shouldn't go to that place. I shouldn't wear those clothes. You know, I, I, It can affect so many things in my life as a Christian because the fact that Jesus is my Lord and I want to reflect well on Him. That's the first principle. That's to guide your choices not the opinions of other people, the Lord. Number two, Romans 14, 10 to 12, gives us a second principle that's the guide, the choices, and convictions of a Christian. And what does that tell us? In Romans 14, 10 to 12, what is the second great reality? We are all going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. God is going to call each one in this room who belongs to him by name you will stand at his throne. And on that day, the Bible says, God is going to take your life and throw it into a fire of testing. Everything that was worthwhile, that, was, that truly brought honor to God, will come out of that fire like gold, silver, and precious stones. Everything else will be consumed, be burned. Knowing that you're going to give account of yourself to God, one thing a Christian should ask themselves is am I going to be thankful I did this on that day? Am I going to be ashamed on that day that I'm doing what I'm about to do right now? It's the fact that Jesus is Lord. I have to ask myself, can I do this to his honor, number one? Number two, will I be thankful or ashamed at the judgment seat that I did what I'm thinking of doing right now? That's the second principle that guides you. The third one is the entire rest of Romans 14, verses 13 to 23, and that is this, I should never do anything that makes my brother stumble. 
So if it causes someone else who's trying to follow Jesus and they see me and they see how I talk and how I live, and because of the way I, the fact I don't care about how it affects anybody else, my other brother who's trying to follow Jesus, but he looks at me and it makes him discouraged and say, wait a minute, I guess I can just live however I want to live too. And he walks away from Jesus. The Bible says I should never engage in a behavior that would make someone else fall away from him. And by the way, that chapter ends and says, you know what? In your own personal life, whatever you do, if you can't do it in faith, you shouldn't do it. If you're not confident before God that you can engage in this behavior, if in your own heart and conscience you have a real doubt about it, don't do it. So number one, the fact that Jesus is Lord determines how I live. Number two, the fact that I'm going to give account to him. Number three, I never want to do anything that makes my brother stumble. And then number four, Romans 15, 1 to 3 said what? The fourth principle is this. Do whatever helps your neighbor toward God. So don't do anything that makes your brother stumble, but do everything that helps him toward God. So if there are things that I could do that would help my neighbor see how great my Savior is, then I want to do it. And so we saw on that day that the Christian, you know what the biggest concern for him is? Everything he does, he does it for the sake of the gospel. So when I'm with people that are Jewish people, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I adapt myself to their culture. If I'm with Gentiles, I adapt myself to their, their culture. If I'm with someone who is weak in this faith and thinks he has to still observe several things, I will go ahead and adapt to his company. Everything I do, I do it for the sake of the gospel. My biggest concern is will more people know about Jesus? So these are the four principles that guide a Christian's life. And guys, are you putting those into practice in these last, are you thinking about them at all? It would be no, it would be pointless to walk in and take the time on Sunday and walk right out and just go keep on doing what you're doing. What God wants me to do is say, listen, I just taught you, I gave you strength from my word, now you know how to make the choices in your life. There they are, right there. The fact that I'm your Lord, the fact you're gonna give account to me, that you never want to do anything that makes someone else stumble, but you want to do whatever helps them toward God. So you should ask yourself Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, everywhere you are, at your job, with your family, in your neighborhood, where does what I'm doing and saying fit underneath those four principles? Then last week we came to Romans 15 verse 4 where he said, because he just referenced Jesus in verse 3 and said, look at Jesus, how Jesus was willing to serve. That's how your attitude should be. And he said, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Now, we come to this, verses 5 and 6 this morning, and we want to answer this question from Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. Can Christians with different personal convictions enjoy a great unity is it possible that in the same congregation we could have people who have different personal convictions and yet they still have a great unity together you would never know they thought differently about certain things you say wow i haven't seen that very much because what usually happens is i was talking to a guy last night one of our the newest driver who drives for us this guy is a born again christian he was saved by god's grace but he told me, he said, when I first became a Christian, I quickly got discouraged. I was in several different churches and I saw the judgmentalism and the criticism towards one another. And he said, it really discouraged me because I was reading the Bible and I thought it was going to be love and encouragement. And I got around these Christians and they're mad at that Christian because he has different convictions and, and he, this one doesn't see. And they're all griping and criticizing each other. The question is this, is it possible that in a congregation of all human beings saved by God's grace, who may have different personal convictions about matters of which the scriptures have not spoken, all Christians have the same convictions of whatever the scripture has said clearly. Where scripture has not spoken, there is a liberty. 
Christianity is not about hundreds of laws. And again, you know what's amazing? I told you about the Jewish man I met last week. Do you know that one of the issues with Jewish people today is they actually now revere to a greater degree the commentaries on the Old Testament more than the Old Testament. So the Jewish people have something called the Mishnah. They have the Talmud. These are all commentaries of the rabbis on the Old Testament. And what the rabbis would do is they'd say, okay, here's God's law. But just so we make sure you don't disobey God's law, we're going to put a rule over here. That way, if you never cross this line, you'll never cross this one. But then this rule becomes the thing that's actually, the, they forget about God's law. Now it's the rabbi's law they're trying to follow. Within Judaism, there's all kinds of different branches of Judaism. They all don't agree with each other. But see, Christianity is not meant to be that way. So now what happens sometimes in Christianity, you have different little churches, they do, and they think that church is bad because they don't do something about which the Scripture never spoke about. And they judge these other people. And so sometimes people say, wow, why are there so many different strands and you guys all don't like each other it shouldn't be that way the Christian life is one of freedom you are free in Christ Jesus just remember that he's your Lord whatever you do do it to his honor you're going to give account to him one day don't do anything that makes someone else stumble but do whatever helps them toward God now go and live now is it possible then in a congregation of people who as they live out their life as a Christian, they, they want to please the Lord, and certain ones can engage in behaviors other ones themselves don't feel comfortable with, or vice versa. Can a group of people who may do things differently in their personal life all come together and have a great unity? Is it possible? And this passage tells us it is, and how it is. And let's see how that is. Romans chapter 15 and verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement. Now, isn't that interesting? Romans 15, verse 4 told us what gives us endurance and encouragement. Last week, Romans 15, verse 4 told us where do we get endurance and where do we get encouragement? Lord. From the scripture. But now verse 5 says God is the one who gives you encouragement and endurance. So what does that tell you about the word? What's that? From God. It's from God. Verse 4 says, Scripture gives you endurance and it get, cheers you on. Well, where are the Scriptures from? They're from God. In fact, the Bible tells us all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. In other words, God uses his word to take you to the gym spiritually. It's your trainer. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Teaching is helping me learn. Reproof is showing me where I'm wrong. Correction is showing me how to get it right. And training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. By the time this person has been under God's word for an extended period of time, you're going to see a completely ready individual. So Romans 15 verse 5 tells me that God is the one who's, who's talking to you through Scripture. And He gives you encouragement and endurance. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you. That means give you. May the God of endurance and encouragement give you to live in such harmony. This is a word that means to have the same mind. You guys think alike. You agree. Your minds are like thinking like one unit. Guys, the best basketball team I ever saw was the Boston Celtics. Uh, the late 1980s when you had Bird and Parrish and McHale and all these guys. And you know what was great about that team? They all thought the same. These guys could be anywhere on the floor. They always knew what the other guy was going to do. They thought like one unit. 
The Bible says, may God grant you, may God give you the ability to live having the same mind. In other words, God could actually give to a congregation, he could strengthen all of us so that we begin to think together. May God grant you this, to live in such a harmony with one mind, with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus. Guys, so this tells me something. Verse 5 says, may God give this to you. I, I went through and saw every time in the New Testament where the Bible says, would God give you this? Would God give you this? Even the Bible tells us that God grants us faith in Jesus. That God grants us repentance that leads to eternal life. That God gives us supernatural power. That God gives us earthly blessings in answer to prayer. That God gives us everything that belongs to eternal life and godliness. And God gives us his precious and very great promises. Let me ask you a question. What does that tell me? If God is the one who gives me faith and gives me repentance and gives me power and gives me blessings in answer to prayer, gives me everything I need for eternal life and godliness, what does that tell me about God? He is the source of the Christian life. Everything I need to live a life that pleases God, God has to give me. None of it comes from within. You say, right now in my life, I am really struggling having the same mind with my spouse, with a, a fellow Christian. I'm really struggling inside. You need God to give you what you don't have. When the Bible tells you repeatedly over and over again that all these things that, are, that belong to the Christian life, God has to give them to you. And the Bible says in Romans 15, if you're going to have a mind that thinks alike, if you're going to have a unanimous mind, God has to give it to you. May the God who gives endurance and the God who gives encouragement, may He give you the ability to live in one mind in accord with Christ Jesus. That means following the pattern of Jesus. What was the mind that Jesus had? God has to give you that kind of a mind. What was the mind that Jesus had? Listen to Philippians 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do you guys know that Jesus, there was not one thing he did in his life that flowed out of selfish ambition or conceit? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I know from my own life, I know this about yourself, so often in interpersonal conflict, what's the issue? is you see yourself, you're more important than that person, what you want, how you feel. And we naturally, it's very hard, no one wants to be quote unquote, the doormat. I don't want you to walk all over me. The Bible says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let not each of you look only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And what is the natural reaction to that? Well, if I don't look out for number one, who is going to? And you're so afraid. The scripture says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, Jesus could have come to this earth and said, do you know who I am? How dare you, you Roman soldier, you're gonna whip me with that cord? Who's giving you the breath right now that in your lungs? Who created your body that's pumping the blood? And you're gonna take those same hands that I created and you're gonna whip me? 
The scripture says, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is who I am. This is my position. But made, the Bible says, he emptied himself. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and how far did his humility go? The Bible says, and being found in human form, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The God of the universe let human beings nail him to a cross. Now, how humble is that? And the Bible says, let that mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, guys, I cannot, everything in my flesh would rise up against that kind of a mind. How unjust, how, how totally unbelievable that the Lord Jesus would allow the God of the universe allow human beings who he could take out like that to do that to him if I'm going to have that kind of mind God has to give it to me may the God of endurance and encouragement give you to live in such harmony with one mind in the pattern of Jesus, verse 5 says, the mind that Jesus had. So that what's the result, verse 6? That together, this word means unanimous. You unanimously, you, to, all of you are unanimous. You may with one voice, this word voice is actually the word mouth. It's almost as though this congregation only had one mouth. These guys are such a unit. They are so together. And guys, unity in the Christian life is not because we agree on every last little thing about which the scripture is not spoken. One guy feels good to eat meat, the other guy doesn't. The one guy feels comfortable to drink wine, the other guy doesn't. The, whatever it may be, it's not that the thing that gives me unity is you and I have to agree on every last single point about which Jesus, God has not spoken. We've already just read Romans 14. He said that's not the case. But still, is it possible that human beings who have different personal convictions and choices all have such the same mind together that if you listen to them, you're hearing one mouth talk. They all say the same thing. And what does that mouth do? Verse 6. They glorify. Remember, that means they express the value, the worth. They honor the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, just in case some people may see that expression, well, what does that mean, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says when Jesus was on earth in Philippians chapter 2, as we just read a minute ago, that he took upon him, he emptied himself while he was on this earth. He took it, he made, made in the likeness of men. And in that position on earth, he addressed God as his father. But in reality, in eternity, are God and Christ Jesus the same? Yes, that's what Jesus said. I and the Father are one. But on this earth, Jesus su submitted himself and would actually pray to God. He would actually address God as his Father in his humanity. This is why the Bible says that one of the expressions for Jesus is that he is the Son of God. That means that when Mary was pregnant, what was inside her womb was placed there by the Holy Spirit. In that way, God was his Father. 
This was an earthly title between Christ and God when he was here. But from eternity, John 17 says, you and I have been perfectly one. They are the same. In fact, the scripture says that Jesus is God, the expressed representation of him on earth, the exact imprint of his nature, Hebrews chapter 1. But when he was on earth, Jesus addressed him as Father. The Bible says, may God grant all of us, those of us who have naturally proud and, and by the way, guys, do you know that the book of Proverbs says, you know the real cause of contention? Pride. Those of us who are proud and selfish, and all of a sudden I have someone in my life that doesn't agree with me on something, I, and it's natural for me to want to criticize and want to judge them and separate from them, as this has happened in many Christian congregations. I have seen congregations where people are attending the same place and these people sitting on this side of the congregation don't talk to those people sitting in that kind of congregation. That's wrong. If we all have truly been converted by Christ Jesus, may God grant us that we would have the same mind, the mind that Jesus had, and the mind that Jesus had was that he made himself of no reputation. He did nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. He considered other people more significant than himself. He looked not only to his own interest, but to their interest. May God give me that kind of mind so that together, we with one mouth, we all say, guys, everybody out here in Providence, God is so valuable. What he's done for me is so amazing. Instead of listening to me criticize another Christian over here, or gripe about that one over there, or judge that one over there. And how many people out here in the world, because they've got around quote-unquote Christians, who that's their attitude. They're mad at other professing Christians. And they're criticizing, and they're comparing, and they're judging. And they're like, man, how are you people any different from everybody else I work with and live with? Get away from me. Could we have a congregation? Is it possible there could be a real church where people have different personal convictions, but they have one voice, and everything points to Jesus Christ? Sadly, there are a lot of people, whether or not they truly know the gospel, I don't know. But there are a lot of professing Christians, the thing that you know about them is their personal standards or convictions more than you know how awesome the Savior is. If that's ever the case, if that's ever what you're known for, if you're known for the fact that you have these specific standards and convictions, that's the thing that your life shouts and your life does not shout how valuable God is because he gave me Christ, then there's something wrong. Instead of being embroiled in debate and judgment and criticism, we all are praising the value of God who gave us Christ. You know something, ladies and gentlemen? The unity of believers glorifies God. When believers have, when they speak with one mind, it demonstrates to the world that God is very valuable, that you can take a congregation of people of all different races, social backgrounds, educational backgrounds, perspectives, and something happens to all of them that, that curbs their selfishness and their pride and they have this one voice and everyone just, just is talking about how awesome God is because he gave them Christ. You know what, that kind of, that really glorifies God. But disunity dishonors God. Notice a couple passages of me. Go to 1 Corinthians. If you turn over one book there to your right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people 
that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What a shame, guys. It's such a shame if among believers there is quarreling and discord and strife. It ought not be. God says, I want you, I want you guys to all agree. Fast forward to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. What is the unity that we have? What is it based on? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's what we share. That's what we have in common. That's the basis of our unity is the fact that we have one Spirit and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and the same God who is over all of us and through all of us and in all of us. Go to the next book, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Guys, that is a church that glorifies God, a church that has one mind. And this mind has one thing that it wants to talk about. God is so great because He gave us Christ. And that is the clear message you hear from that congregation. Anything less than that is ugly and it dishonors God. May God, the God of encouragement and comfort and endurance, grant you May He give you the same mind, the mind that's like Jesus, so that with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Together you would speak with one voice. You know what these two verses remind us? That the only way to live in a way that glorifies God is if God enables you to, if God gives you the ability to. That's true in a congregation. That's true in a marriage. That's true in your friendships. That's true in dealing with your siblings, whatever it may be. You need God to give you something for that to happen. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling and may fulfill every resolve for good. So even as you're sitting here today, you're listening to God's word and say, yes, I need to change. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says, may God fulfill that resolve. And every work of faith by His power so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in you and Him, according to the grace, that's the strength that He supplies of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we learn, is that if I'm ever going to be what God wants me to be and have that attitude, He's got to give it to me. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, whoever speaks, let him speak the oracles of God, the words of God. Whoever serves, let him serve by the strength that God supplies so that in everything God is glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. May, may God's people be just strengthened by the Lord. May God be giving it to them so that He is glorified. And so everyone who's serving, they do it through the strength He supplies, not through their strength. Now, ladies and 
ladies and gentlemen, what have we learned in the last couple of weeks? Where does God, where, where is the container that God dispenses what we need? The scriptures and the, this one tells us something today also. Prayer. This is a prayer. God, would you do this? Guys, this morning, if you need faith, if you need repentance, if you need supernatural power in some way, if you need God to bless you in some way, everything you need for life and godliness, the Bible says God gives it to you. Including to have one mind with your fellow believers so that you all unanimously with one mouth you express the value of God because he gave you Christ. Wouldn't that feel nice to God to clean out all the filth of the, the, the criticism and the judgment and the anger and the bitterness and the gossip and the slander? And just right inside. So this is what we've learned from verses 4, 5, and 6. That if I am going to endure and not give up when, when times are hard and I'm emotionally hurt, whatever it may be, I need God to cheer me on. He does it through the scriptures so they convince me that what God has promised will happen. Then I go to him in prayer and I say, Lord, you are the God of endurance and encouragement. You're the one who breathed out those scriptures. I'm asking you that you would grant me that I would have the mind of Christ. The mind that did nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, that counted others more significant than himself, that looked not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others, that makes himself of no reputation and is willing to be so humbled I mean, that's the greatest degree of humility for God to let human beings to do that to him. God, would you give me that kind of a mind? So that as a congregation, the thing that this congregation shouts is God is so valuable. He is so worth it because he gave me Christ. And Christ means everything. He's changed me. If you're going to have that kind of a heart, if the congregation is going to have this kind of heart, God's got to give it to us. Listen to these two last passages. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, closes with a prayer and it says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And what will be the result of that? The God of love and peace will be with you. Isn't that what we want, guys? Don't. What's the purpose if you're going to go through your life and God's not with you? God says, you know what, you, you congregation, if you guys will rejoice and aim for restoration and encourage one another and agree with one another and live in peace, the God of love and peace will be with you. Finally, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, and above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Guys, I want to ask you, recently in your Christian life, has it been all about you, what you're feeling? If that's the case, you're, you don't have the mind of Christ. You need to go to the Lord and ask Him that He would give you the mind of Christ. Lord, we pray today that you would grant this to us. You would grant us that we would live in such unity with one mind, just like Jesus. 
that together with one voice we would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our selfishness and in our pride. And we ask that you would give us the mind of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.